<laughs> Thank you, Larry. Now, look, for those of you who think tax is boring and tax is somehow an issue for specialists, let me reassure you there are two three-letter words in the English language, both ending with X, which <laughs> cause more newspaper column lines than any <laughs> other matter apart from football. And tax actually at one level is fascinating and it isn't complicated. We pay money to a government and the government provides us with services. And that relationship, that contract, the social contract between us and government is what makes people like you and me work in harmony. It allows us to work in harmony. We wouldn't have the road systems, the education systems, the health systems without tax. It just wouldn't be possible. So one of the first things we've got to do is address the fact that for the last, certainly through my lifetime, the right have been attacking the very idea of tax. Our Prime Minister said last year he hates the idea of tax. And all that tells me is that he's an immature little baby. But you cannot run a society without tax. Democracy requires tax, and tax is the lifeblood of of society. So I think it's time that we now had a global discussion about tax, not mediated by the right-wing media. Um, I'm going to be talking um, very broadly about a whole host of issues. Don't worry, too much, not too much technical detail. There will be some charts, but you don't need to remember them. And if any of you want clarification of any points, just ask me and I'll, I'll, I'll clarify. But one point I want to begin with is this letter from The Guardian last year. How much are we talking about? Well, the estimate for Britain is that we lose £120 billion every single year to tax evasion, tax avoidance, and <coughs> tax not being collected. And for those of you who are familiar with our austerity package in this country, we would have more than enough, there's £20 billion left over, uh, if we were serious about addressing this issue. So we're talking fairly considerable sums of money. I just want to stress that. I also want to make the point that all figures need to be treated with a certain amount of, not suspicion, but these, that we're engaged here in an exercise in night vision. The government concedes 45 billion. Uh, that's their estimate of the, what's called the tax gap in Britain. Um, but you're going to see later on some much, much bigger figures. So get used to the idea of talking trillions. And a trillion is one million million. Get your head round that for a second. So um, let me begin by telling you a little bit about who we are. Tax Justice Network was launched in 2003. Um, I was one of the founders. Um, it was largely founded in, by European economists and some lawyers. We are a global network of researchers, practicing professionals, economists, lawyers, financial specialists, chartered accountants. We work with civil society organisations. We provide our expertise to groups like Oxfam and Christian Aid uh, and the Green Party. I've worked with Caroline Lucas for many years um, and across the globe. In 2003, I was given a simple task, create a global tax justice movement. And I was given 400 Swiss francs to get things started. And that was it, Larry. <laughs> that was enough to get a, a website started. Um, uh, and certainly things have moved on a little bit by, by that. This, this testimonial actually came in yesterday from Thomas Piketty. And I don't mind boasting about it. I think we've done an amazing job of putting tax justice on the agenda, just the, to the point of getting people like David Cameron saying, yes, we recognise there is such a thing as tax justice. We branded it. Um, we started the debate deliberately to, to link the word tax to the word justice, so people understood that this is part of a broader economic justice movement. And what we've done in the last 10 years is take this out of the obscurity, the work we, we, we the area we work in, out of the obscurity of small working parties at the Organisation for Economic Cooperation and Development in Paris, and the United Nations Tax Committee, which meets in Geneva, and put it onto the front pages of newspapers, and that was my job, to, to, to bring this alive so that ordinary people would start recognising it impacts them. Um, I don't expect you to be able to read this, but I'd just like to point out that the movement we've got is actually a movement in three parts. <coughs> on the one hand, 
we have a program of investigative journalism. And for those of you who've, for example, picked up on stories about Google and Amazon and Starbucks and so on, most of those stories come from us. Uh, and we train investigative journalists across the world, from across the world. Over 80 countries so far have been through our training program in how to investigate this kind of um, tax evasion, tax avoidance, and illicit flows, particularly from the poorer countries. Second part in the middle is, is my kind of part. That's the, the research network, which is just about 1,200 people across 80, 80 countries or so. Um, and all we do is we aim to set up research programs linking up with universities and others to help the campaigning side, the Oxfams and the Christian Aids and so on, to do campaigning work. Um, and that's the global structure. We operate in over 80 countries. It's a, co not, it's a complex structure at one level because um, it's, it doesn't have any central organisation at all. It's just networks, just based around chap country chapters. I've never, you asked me, what are they doing in Kenya at the moment? I have no idea. I know that we have a fantastic chapter in Kenya. And one of our great success stories has been in southern Africa, in fact, in fact, the whole of Africa. If you go back 10 years ago and attended elections in Africa, and as I did, tax was never on the agenda. Politicians were all promising, you know, you'll have health centres and you'll have local schools and I'll get a road punched through the forest to get to your town. But they never, ever discussed how it was going to be funded. And by and large, the funding came either from aid or external debt, which is the most expensive way of funding anything, and the most catastrophic way, because it meant the politicians were never accountable to the local constituencies. They were accountable to the aid agencies, or the IMF, or the banks that were lending them the money. My view is that the next phase, the exit strategy away from aid dependence, has to be a three-letter word ending with X. In other words, we have to build sustainable tax regimes across Africa. And what we've done in Africa is we've got that debate started, and that's terrific. So that's who we are and what we're doing. I'm going to make three propositions just to get the discussion going. First of all, taxes play a fundamental part in shaping development processes and building citizen-state relations. If you look at countries which don't have proper tax regimes. Let's think about hydrocarbon exporting countries like Algeria or Libya or Nigeria, just had an election, Angola. Because they largely rely upon hydrocarbon ta um, royalties and taxes, they don't have sophisticated income tax or capital gains taxes or property tax regimes. The politicians deal largely with the oil companies and then distribute largesse in a very pork barrel way. You don't have the advanced state-citizen relationship that you have in this country. What you're going to hear throughout the next month, as we, in the build-up to the elections, will be politicians talking about ex money being spent and how they're going to raise it. And we'll have this usual thing about accusations that such and such a party is going to raise taxes, and we're going to lower it. Um, so taxes play a fundamental part in shaping development process, processes. Secondly, and this is, I think, indisputable, tax regimes over the course of the last 20 years have been shaped to reflect the power of big business. And big business is constantly, as they did today, demanding tax cuts. And so we get a coalition government in 2010 which says we are a tax-cutting government, and they did. They cut the business tax, corporate income tax, from 28% to now 20%, but they raised VAT. VAT affects all of us. It's a very regressive tax. It affects the poorest households most, um, and of course capital, in capital uh, taxes like uh, corporate income tax affect the wealthy. Not surprising that this country has become very much more unequal in the last 30 years as we've gone through this extraordinary shift in the tax charge. Um, and if it's bad here, believe you me, it's much, much worse in most developing countries. 
partly because the IMF, in its infinite wisdom, has been pushing VAT to substitute for trade and, uh, trade and ta uh, taxes and trade tariffs. They cut the trade <coughs> tariffs and substituted VAT, and unlike Britain, they have not allowed exemptions. In Britain, food is exempt, energy is exempt, children's clothing is exempt, newspapers are exempt. The, VAT, the IMF VAT regime doesn't allow any exemptions at all. So I'm going to talk a bit more about that. And then large, lastly, this is why I want to flag this up. Does, any, and, and as an aside, does anyone know what David Cameron's hashtag is? <laughs> no, his hashtag is, hashtag is global race. Global race. And what's he referring to? He's referring to this word competitiveness. This word you'll hear all the time. Britain has to cut its taxes and business in order to compete. Britain must deregulate in order to compete. We can't afford a carbon tax or any environmental measures because we have to compete. Have you heard that? This, I'm going to talk more about that later on, because I think this is the most insidious pol political rhetoric we have. And um, we, the Tax Justice Network, have set this as our next big target. Um, in a film coming out just in just a few weeks' time, a Michael Winterbottom film with Russell Brand starring, um, the Prime Minister is actually filmed talking about Britain must compete on this race to the bottom and I'm saying, yes, that come in immediately afterwards saying, talking about tax competition is a sign of economic illiteracy. Tax competition is pure economic illiteracy. No economist in the world would recognise this. And yet, our, it's at the core of our government's economic policy. We must now address this seriously. OK, so, interested so far? Shall I... Give up. Okay, good. <laughs> Let's move on. And some more figures. Um, I, 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 we began, we deliberately began our work on tax justice, um, or rather, when we launched Tax Justice Network, we began with a focus on developing countries because the impact has been devastating for developing countries. For those of you who have an interest in Africa, this book is by far the best book, and I don't have any commissions, I don't take royalties from it, so I can say that with... Absolute hand on heart, uh, I, I really believe it, because this actually looks at what's happened to Africa's money. We have been told over the last 40 years, 50 years, Africa's a basket's case, it's totally indebted, they don't know how to spend their money. Actually, that's not the situation at all. Huge sums have float, flowed out of Africa over the last, and when I took, it's a huge, their estimate, 944 billion, since 1970, of illicit flows coming out of Africa is the best estimate I've seen. Look at the external debts for all of the sub-Saharan African countries. At the end of 2008, 177 billion. You don't need to be a mathematician to recognize that actually Africa is a net creditor to the rest of the world. What has happened to that money? That's the task I set myself. In, back in 1978 when I was working with Oxfam in 78, okay? So my interest in this goes back that far. And at that time, we were looking at money and we, it was clear to us that huge sums of it were flowing out of Africa into London. Hence, I've just put out this book here, this How Corrupt is, Brit uh, is Britain book. I recommend it to you. My chapter in that is called On Her Majesty's Secrecy Service. I've been waiting to use that chapter for a long, that title for a long time. Um, the book was launched last week. George Monbiot covered it in The Guardian two weeks ago. Um, huge proportions of that money came here to Britain. And it came via Britain's extensive network of offshore secrecy jurisdictions. The Cayman Islands, British Virgin Islands, Anguilla, Turks and Caicos, Gibraltar, Bermuda, Channel Islands and uh, Isle of Man, all of these are British secrecy jurisdictions. As it happens, I'm from Jersey. <laughs>
and for 11 years I was economic advisor to the government of Jersey, which is how I really managed to get underneath the, the skin. If we look at how much money has flowed um, offshore, this is just personal wealth, this has nothing to do with corporate wealth, this is just personal wealth. We estimated that the bottom end figure, which is the figure here, 13 trillion, 21 trillion US dollars, that's the, um, the low end estimate of our estimate from 2012 of how much personal wealth now sits offshore um, untaxed. And needless to say, that money is concentrated in the hands of a very, very tiny elite. 0.1%, not the 1%, not the, the 0.1%. The top end estimate is um, 32 trillion US dollars. And that's a conservative figure, I can assure you of that, because it only looks at financial instruments. In other words, cash and, and financial <coughs> instruments. It doesn't look at real estate and the jets and the works of art and the gold and all the other asset classes that the wealthy like to hold. Increasingly, they're using works of art um, because that's seen as uh, a superb hedge against what everyone now expects to be a, a, a mighty collapse coming in the next few years. So how does this happen? How did it go? Well, that's, that was what interested me when I was working with Oxfam back in the 78, 79 period. Um, and I decided that I'd give up. Um, I'd just finished my training as a forensic investigator uh, and as an economist. And I decided I'd return home to Jersey. I'm sure all of you know Jersey, uh, or know where it is at least. But uh, anyway, that's where I'm from. And I, got, I went back in the 80s, mid-80s, and I got a job working with a company called Deloitte Touche, at that time Touche Ross, their offshore division. And by this stage, I'd finished my training as a forensic uh, investigator uh, and, and as an economist, and I deliberately chose Deloitte Touche because they had clients right the way across Africa, Latin America, and Asia. And their Jersey division was the offshore division where they handled their clients' affairs. So I was able to get right into the office where all this stuff was happening. And once you're there, of course, you have access to all the files. So what did the client files show me? Well, this is just the work I did. The clients were involved in insider trading, market rigging, avoiding disclosure of conflicts of interest, illicit arms trading, illicit political campaign donations, contract kickbacks, bribery, fraudulent invoicing, tax evasion, and trade mispricing. I didn't come across a single client file where there was legitimate activity, where you could actually say there's a good reason for this client to be using Deloitte Touche in Jersey. Interestingly, many years later, when I went back with a journalist and interviewed my former, my former boss, um, and said, on the record, can you give us a single legitimate activity that actually happens here? <laughs> he, uh, and, and he said, uh, well, yes, for example, inherent, in, Italian inheritance law is very restrictive, so Italians can use Jersey laws to get out of using Italian laws. I said, and that's okay, is it? <laughs> I mean, what is this nonsense? And then he said, well, also, there are many men who don't, want their wives to know what assets they have because if it comes to... And, and this is legitimate? <laughs> uh, and that's the best they could come up with. It's, it's beyond pathetic. Deloitte Touche is not an exception. All the big four accounting firms and many other uh, big global accounting firms operate exactly the same operations. You know about HSBC, Barclays, R RBS, Lloyds. They're all ex handling exactly the same kind of stuff. The British banking industry is as corrupt and as criminal as any banking industry in the, in, in the world. Um, the idea that Switzerland is the main culprit is frankly naive. Switzerland is a particularly difficult case, but I think that Britain is much, much worse. And our kind of corruption in Britain is at the highest level. All of the institutions of Britain, including the serious fraud office and the press, blah de blah they're all <coughs> implicated in one way or another. One of the, my big criticisms, and I've just come back from Manchester this, this afternoon, there's a conference going on there about the problems with economics 
Well, I studied economics for seven years. I studied global trade and investment theory here in Oxford, at London School of Economics, and at Reading. You'd have thought that somewhere along the line they'd have mentioned tax havens, because almost all investment, cross-border investment, goes through tax havens. Almost all global trade goes on paper through tax havens. Never mentioned once. There's this huge blind spot in economics. It just doesn't get mentioned. So let's take you on a little bit of a, a journey into how these huge sums are moved offshore. Most of them are moved through, um, through illicit financial, tr uh, through trade mispricing. Back in 2006, I was trying to persuade Oxfam here in, 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 in uh, Oxford to start working on tax justice. Many years earlier, in 2000, Oxfam published a report which I was, part, uh, I was involved in called Tax Havens Releasing the Hidden Billions for Development. And that report got a lot of interest from around the world. And everyone thought, well, Oxfam's going to campaign on this. But they didn't. They said to me, it's too big, it's too complex, we need a global network. So you can do it. <laughs> uh, not quite, but anyway. But then, when I went to see them in 2006, they were still focusing on trade justice. And they said, if you can make a link between trade justice and tax justice, then we might be able to do something. So I said, yeah, OK, let's take the totemic, totemic trade justice item, the banana, and look at how the banana is traded, not physically, but on paper. L let's look at what happens to the money. So this example is a case study I worked up with the Guardian newspaper, which was published in 2007, I think in November. If you want to read the whole article, just Google tax justice goes bananas, and it'll take you straight there the whole case study. And it's full front page, as you can see, and two full inside pages detailing how one particular banana company traded in practice, shifting its profits out of the producer country and out of the consumer country. But um, the, com the company we selected um, isn't that different from the other. There are five big banana trading companies, Geest, Del Monte, Chiquita, uh, Dole, and I've forgotten another one, it's an Ecuadorian company. Um, hmm? They're gone. They're, um, uh, and we selected Geest because um, happily American accounting standards required them to produce more information, but Dole showed a very similar picture. For those of you who are not familiar with how multinational companies trade, this is a fascinating journey. The journey of the bananas, the fruit themselves, by boat, out of Latin America, into England. Let's assume we're, we go into a shop around the corner and buy a pound's worth of bananas. Let's look at the money, how the money spread out across the different places. First of all, 13 pence of that pound stays in the producer country, um, of which 1.5 is labour costs, 10.5 is production costs, 1 pence or 1% is taxable profits left there with a tax rate of 30%, 0 0.3 pence of, of tax stays in the producer country. And by the way, all of these figures were verified and confirmed by the company. The company accepted the figures. So there's never been any dispute about this. Now, the journey on paper is a much more exotic journey. Um, and I'd like to stress something. Everything here that happens is permissible under the, the global rules. And that's the problem. The global rules are completely broken. So they invoice... Oh, something there. They invoice from sub the, the producer company uh, subsidiary in Latin America onto the Cayman Islands where they charge for the use of their own purchasing network. Let's just stop and think about it. They charge for the use of their own purchasing network. They've created an intellectual property right called a purchasing network. 
and they charge themselves. Look at the scale, eight pence compared to 13, point, 13 pence, you know, a very significant charge. On to Luxembourg, where they charge themselves for the use of their own finance. On to Ireland, where they charge for the use of their brand. Now, how many of you have ever gone into the grocery shop and said, I will have a kilo of your finest geese bananas, please, my good man? <laughs> there's only one, there's only one recognised brand which has any value in this country and in most countries, and that's fair, fair trade. No one else goes, oh, I must have Dole, I love Dole. Fantastic. Just doesn't happen. Then on to the Isle of Man, where they charge for the use of their own insurance services, the reinsurance service. On to Jersey, where they charge for the use of management <coughs> services. Now, this is actually why I knew about this, because I'd helped set that company up. And if I told you that that company currently charges approximately 100 million a year for the use of management services, and if you go to the office, as I did two years ago with the French television uh, team, the office was abandoned. They have 1980s Amstrad computers on their desk. The photographer who, lives in, who works in the opposite next door said, oh, they come once a month to collect the mail, that's about it. But they're charging hundreds of millions for management services. It's completely bogus, of course. And then on to Bermuda, where they charge, whoops, what happened there? Where they charge themselves for the use of their own distribution network. Now, what's, what's happened is your piece of fruit has been repackaged as a whole set of services and intellectual property rights, which allow them to shift all of their extraordinary profits offshore to a no-tax environment. And just look at how many of these places are British. Bermuda, Cayman, Jersey, Isle of Man. All British. We can truly say that... We are the world's leading tax haven. <coughs> and then on to the final consumer. Now, what applies to bananas applies to virtually every single traded commodity, goods, services in the world. And the terrible thing about this is that everything there is perfectly legitimate under the current rules. The current rules are completely broken, but it means that huge sums can be shifted offshore outside of the reach of the tax person. With me so far? Um, I, I'm not going to ask if you're happy, but that's... Can I have one little clarification? You said it, it means that huge sums can be um, taken up into these tax havens uh, because they're pretending to move paper around? No, no, Where no, does that, that, that money come from? Well, well the, the money, you see, it's real money. Let's not... But, the, but, but, oh yes, it's real money because we are paying that one pound. Okay? That's real money. But the, what they don't want to do is to report... This is, just, this is just accounting. This is just tricksy accounting. They don't want to report the profits occurring either in the <coughs> producer country or in the consumer <coughs> country. They want to report the profits offshore, where there's no tax. And they accumulate that money offshore. Of course, it doesn't stay there. There's no money in Jersey or in Bermuda or whatever. Um, and that's part of the problem, by the way. If you look, go to America... The big American companies are holding trillions of dollars offshore, uninvested. They don't know what to do with it. The minute they bring it back onshore into America, it triggers a taxable incident. So they don't want to do it. So uh, they, they, it, it, it's completely distorted the global economy. When you say they charge themselves, tax, tax speaking, is that expenses? Yeah, th th these are, these, they say these are costs. Um, all of these companies are subsidiaries of the same <coughs> company. Okay. It's only when it touches Britain that they charge on to the retailers. Um, yeah. and, and they make the costs up. And they employ armies of accountants and economists to, to, to make these costs up and to try to justify them to the tax people. OK, so that's, that's how a huge proportion of these... Monies are shifted offshore. How much? Of 
I've, I've asked the fair trade people, and they haven't so far given me an answer. And that was five years ago, so I, I assume they're still, it's a work in progress. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, there might well be a problem there. <laughs> yes, sure. Do all these places get money themselves for allowing these companies to be set up? What's the advantage to those who've got to vote on to allow this to happen in their own time? Yeah, I mean, okay, that's, a, that's a good question. They're, they're not taxing the com companies, but there's, there's, uh, there are a lot of lawyers doing very good business down there. There are a lot of accounting firms doing very good business there. Um, and they, they will charge company fees, and they don't need a huge sum, so if, you, know, you might have to pay an annual return of £100 in Jersey. But uh, the British Virgin Islands does very good business. They have over 600,000 companies registered there, multiply that by 100, and that's fairly good income <coughs> for a tiny little island. Um, but it's, the, it's, it's, the, it's the, the banking businesses, the accounting firms, and their senior partners who are doing very good business in Jersey. Should I move Jersey on? Must have a reason for allowing this in, in terms of their own advantage if they think they're getting something. I'm trying to figure out. Yeah, what I'll, I'll be happy to answer that later on because um, I, I'm an economic advisor. To, I was economic advisor to the government of Jersey for a long time. I don't think that Jersey got that much of an advantage from it. In fact, quite the opposite. I think it actually destroyed its domestic economy. Um, but there are many people in Jersey who are employed in that sector and earning good money. No question about that. So moving on, now I want to start talking about the big picture. How did this mess happen? And why did this mess happen? This is Kenneth Rogoff, a conservative economist with the International Monetary Fund. His position on tax is fairly typical of this. Globalization strengthened the case for shifting to a flat tax on income or better still consumption. I told you earlier about the IMF's position on VAT with a moderately high exemption. Aside from the usual efficiency arguments, it is just going to become increasingly difficult and costly to maintain complex and idiosyncratic national tax arrangements. That's fairly typical of the conservative position. The conservative position is it's a complicated tax to apply for multinational companies are complex. They can shift their profits offshore. So why don't we simply abandon the corporate income tax? If we do that, we abandon the opportunity to tax capital. End off. It's not just big multinational companies who use <coughs> cult corporates, it's also wealthy individuals. They all own all of their assets through companies. Stop taxing them, you've given up taxing wealth. So that's one position. But let's look at what's happened to tax and our ability as nation states to tax as a result of globalization. Since the 1970s, in other words, since globalization kicked in, exchange controls have been eliminated, enabling trillions to shift offshore. Evasion has become endemic <coughs> across most countries in the world. Um, one estimate, tax losses to ev tax evasion, um, 3.1 trillion every single year across the world. It's quite clear that austerity is an ideological imposition rather than a necessity. No question about that. Alongside that, alongside the capital market liberalization, which exchange controls were part of, trade tariffs and direct taxes have been significantly reduced, in many cases simply eliminated, with regressive VATs being substituted. Now, Trade tariffs and direct taxes are generally quite progressive taxes, but the problem was that in removing them, uh, first of all, we destroyed many of the local industries in many of the poorest countries by doing that. But the fact of the matter is, and the IMF, their own figure is that for every dollar of trade taxes lost as a result of cutting tax, those taxes, at best, even the most advanced tax authorities in the poorer countries have only been able to recuperate 30 cents. That's the best. So it's been a massive hemorrhaging of tax revenues to the poorer countries. Um, and what we've seen is a, as a result of the, the kind of the weaknesses of the international framework for taxing companies, we've seen a huge growth of intra-company intra cross-border trade. 
um, which has massively increased the opportunities for trade mispricing along the lines of the banana model. Um, which means that tax avoidance has, has gone stratospheric. Now, we were told for a long time, for many, many years, um, the OECD said to me and the IMF said to me, oh, it's just a case of a few rotten barrels, and that's why we got the journalists to work on this. That's why we did Starbucks and Google and Amazon, because they, they could no longer say it's just a few rotten apples, particularly once we'd done Apple. You know, <laughs> you know I love that joke. It's, I could repeat it endlessly, but I was really pleased with the Apple investigation because it was no longer possible for the politicians to deny there was a global systemic problem. And that's where we had that trigger point. That's the moment, Larry, when the G20 said, OK, we know it's no longer working, and we have to push the OECD to, 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 to make the changes. The progressive view, this is um, Joseph Stiglitz. Um, I'm sure you're all familiar with his work in The, in the Guardian uh, a couple of years ago is to accept that we have an unmanageable, unfair, distortionary global tax regime. It's pivotal to creating the increased equality that marks most advanced countries. In other words, it's pivotal to destroying the global economy because inequality will destroy the global economy. Simple as that. Um, and if we can't get the tax systems right, um, then we're not going to be able to tackle this. Inequality will inevitably worsen. And there's no point, as far as I'm concerned, in saying, well, we must push for more aid and we must try to tackle debt. But if you don't get the tax, if you don't use tax to redistribute the wealth, then the debt burden will inevitably increase. Indebtedness can only increase in the foreseeable future. So this has now become a structural problem in the global economy. That's the point I want to stress. And that's why we now have G20 and David Cameron and others, who are not natural tax justice supporters, um, saying, yeah, we've got to do something about this. Um, but the economic transformation goes deeper than that, because technology change has revolutionised capital and information flows, <coughs> making it much, much easier for relatively low down, kind of low down the income scale people. Um, in, in, in Luxembourg, they talk about the Belgian vets and, and doctors in other words, it's become possible for a much wider range of people to use offshore to evade tax. Um, and then we have this problem, which is the, the enormous power of transnational companies to push weak nation states to give them tax <coughs> concessions. The so-called tax <coughs> co competition thing, the promotion of export processing zones, tax holidays, deductibility of capital investment, the tax wars, and the race to the bottom. And as far as I'm concerned, the Prime Minister's rhetoric around tax competition and making Britain the most competitive is actually confirmation that he recognises that Britain is a weak destination for productive investment. It's not a sign of strength, it's a sign of weakness on his part. Ed Balls doesn't fare much better, by the way. And so I want to talk a little bit about tax competition now, uh, why it's a nonsense and why it's a particularly dangerous nonsense and why we as Greens now need to address this. Here's another economist, Paul Krugman, a post-Keynesian, talking about competitiveness as a goal is fundamentally misleading. At best, it's a misdiagnosis of our problems. In what way are we as a nation state competing against other nations? You know, I can understand it at the World Cup, yeah, but as a nation state, really? And where will the competition take us? Because for years people have been taking, talking about this race to the bottom. Well, who the hell wants to win a race to the bottom? But there's something particularly insidious about this, which is that if you look at tax competition, for example, we'll set regulation aside for the moment. If you look at tax competition, the problem with tax competition is not that we'll end up having a zero rate of tax on corporate income tax. But actually we have negative rates. Because capitalism has absolutely no limits on how much subsidy capitalist companies will push for. And they're already receiving huge subsidies. We as Greens should be aware of those subsidies. Look at the, subsidy, the massive subsidies that go to the hydrocarbon industry, for example. 
Um, and there is absolutely no limit to the extent to which those subsidies can be increased. Subsidies on labour training, subsidies on new roads being built, infrastructure being built, subsidies on energy, you name it, they will push for it. Uh, and we're now in this ridiculous territory, and some parts of the United States are already in this territory, where you have subsidised capitalism, corporate socialism, and it's complete nonsense. We've moved so far away from the model of a free market. Um, and, but it reflects the power of companies to exert their power over our tax formation process, our tax policy making process. I stress it's not a sign of strength, it's a sign of weakness. And here you have David's hashtag. There's George Osborne. We are building the most competitive tax system in the world. It's an economic nonsense. There's Cameron. I think it's wrong to have completely uncompetitive top, top rates of tax. David. Didn't. Nonsense. But there's Ed Balls. Can I ask what the prize in the competition is then? <laughs> and what they're, say, what they're aiming at is they're saying, we have to do this to attract foreign direct investment. No, but then what is the prize in the difficulty? What's in the head? You win. Some of them do. Sorry? You win. What, by having more money, where? Yeah, and um, look... The, don't spend it on the things... We had a fascinating case study in the last few years because as part of Britain's tax competition strategy, they introduced a patent box facility to attract intellectual property rights to Britain, saying this will attract all sorts of companies. And it did indeed attract several companies, including Fiat. Not a single job. They simply moved a headquarter operation. Not a single job was created. What's the benefit to Britain? Gets back to your point. Actually, the benefits are very, very thin at best. And I want to talk about later about the Irish example, because that's the poster child. That is the poster child of, of tax competition, and that's a complete nonsense. So I've got a question on that. Is there not an argument to say that having a correct tax rate, let's not say it's high or low, correct tax rate means that most normal directors, most normal companies that actually have, a moral, have some sort of moral company, as it were, actually pay due amount of tax, where, is it where if it's too heavily taxed, then more rational people are start avoiding it, so there is a balance. I'm not saying this isn't got too far, I'm saying is there a balance to be had? Of course there is. Yeah, yeah, no one would deny that. However, one of the advantages of having grey hair is that I'm old enough to remember back in the uh, 1970s when the, the lobbies were saying the marginal rate of tax in Britain, 50, up in the 50s, mid-50s, far too high, it's encouraging tax avoidance. Thatcher brought the tax rate down. Uh, and... As, it's, as you heard earlier, it's now come down to 20%. Has tax avoidance diminished? Not a bit. It has increased massively. Uh, the idea that it's the high rates of tax that encourage tax avoidance and tax evasion simply doesn't stand up to any empirical evidence whatsoever. Um, you could take it down to 10% and they'll still be tax avoiding because this is the way they boost their stock option values. Mm. This is now embedded in the model of, cap of capitalism that we've taken on, the shareholder value thing. Um, and and I, I, look, look, at, look at this. By the way, we couldn't get the time series together <coughs> for United Kingdom. We simply don't have a long enough time series to play with. But look at what's happened in the United States as a result of this corporate lobbying. Corporate income tax as a proportion of all taxes. This line, this band here diminished down to that. Look at what's happened to individual income taxes. That is taxes on labour. Slight upward trend. Look at the payroll tax, tax on labour. Massive increase. So you're seeing a, a diminution of taxes on wealth there and there. Massive increase on labour. Think of that as a, at a meta level and that explains why capital is being substituted for labour in so many countries across the world. Uh, and, and why there's so, such a low rate of employment creation outside the minimum wage sphere. Does that explain something? Look at what's happened. Again, the time series, this is OECD, no, IMF data. Um, 
high-income countries, low-income countries, lower, same trend, a lower corporate tax rate, but no sign whatsoever of any diminution in the rate of tax avoidance. It's increased. And part of the reason for it <coughs> increasing is because you have, and I think as an economist I'd say this is a case of supply stimulating demand, you have a huge industry of tax avoiding lawyers and tax avoiding accountants who do extremely good business out of them. I mean, every now and then when I get really angry I like to go and trash PricewaterhouseCoopers um, because PricewaterhouseCoopers, you know, they're, they're, they're as bad as any, but one of the things that I find particularly insidious about PricewaterhouseCoopers is they deliberately targeted senior go governments. You know, guess who advises Ed Balls on tax policy? PricewaterhouseCoopers. And they go into the Treasury and HMRC and shape tax policy and then come out of it and advise their clients on the loopholes. Um, which is why I encourage all of you to nip down to PricewaterhouseCoopers and do whatever you feel necessary to trash the place. <laughs> Occupy them. <laughs> John, John if, you, if you wind up soon, then we'll okay, have... Okay, I'll do that. And then we'll have questions. I'm going to rush through these things. This, this chart... Um, uh, yeah, I'll, I'll be able to skip quite a few. This chart tells you all about what's happened. One of the <coughs> outcomes of this is, is, is that the, there's been a huge shift of power from labour to capital, um, and capital is now earning historically extraordinarily high levels of profit. That tells you um, the profits before tax to GDP. And yet, despite that, we see no increase whatsoever in the corporate tax yield. So they're earning historically high levels of profit. This is the United States data again. Sadly, our data isn't that good. The Treasury really isn't very good uh, at collecting this stuff. Um, and yet no increase whatsoever in the yield from, from companies. And this tells us that this race to the bottom is actually live and kicking. It's, it's actually happening. And it's going to accelerate. Uh, very quickly, you all know Piketty's work on inequality. I think that, and, and Piketty, as you know, talks a lot about the, the case for reviving taxes on wealth there you see in this chart, since the 1980s, the pickup in inequality in the United States, Britain, Canada, and Australia. Much of this rise in wealth inequality is accounted for by the fact that we've simply stopped taxing or are no longer able to effectively tax wealth. Whoops. Um, I'll skip that one. I'm not sure. If, if any of you are interested, I can come back to the Irish model. But the, the myth of the Celtic tiger... You, you are interested, are you? Yeah, yeah. OK. Yeah, the myth of the, tiger, the, Celt, the Celtic tiger model, uh, and we, we've um, uh, investigated this at great length, is that Ireland is the great success story because they set this very low t t rate of tax on, on corporate profits, um, <coughs> and, and that's attracted huge amounts of investment. But look... Their tax haven days go back to 1956. A lot of things happened in 56. I was born that year. But anyway, um, so they started on their tax haven strategy back in 56. But their GDP per capita pretty much flatlined right the way through until then. What's then? Ireland joins the single European market. That's what made the difference. It wasn't the tax. It was something else. It was... the Ireland as a platform for American companies having access to the European single market, having a, a large, highly productive workforce, well-trained, well well-educated, English-speaking, that mattered enormously, and access to the market. But what really kicked things off, sadly for the Irish, at this stage was a complete deregulation of financial services and a huge leveraging of debt around the, pro uh, the property market, and that's what collapsed at that point, Ireland just did the traditional housing bubble thing. Sorry, Celtic tiger never, never roared. So, um, but there's another factor, and this, the Irish never mentioned this. We've only got part of the story, but the Irish were massive recipients of common agricultural policy funding, massive, and also structural funding from Europe under the European Development Fund and under the European Social Fund. 
And that's what helped them to educate their people and build the infrastructure. It was Europe that contributed. So we have this ridiculous situation that they were undermining Europe by becoming a conduit country for American companies' profits being shifted through Ireland to the Bahamas and Bermuda and so on, as we demonstrated with the Amazon and other things, other case studies. Um, but they were massive recipients of funding from the countries that they were under, whose tax regimes they were undermining. I'll cut on that one. I'll cut on that one. I was going to talk a little bit about the, our work on human rights, but if you want to ask me questions, I'll be happy to talk about that. Because... Very quickly, I do want to flag up that we in Britain have a particular responsibility for this. I've already spoken about the British tax havens, but within kind of the rarefied professional work that I do, if you go around the world, Britain's British tax haven, British banks, British lawyers, British um, accounting firms are regarded as the leading companies in this area. We have made it a huge part of our business model. And oddly enough, that goes back to 1956. In 1956, the Bank of England chose to not regulate a bond issue coming out of Midlands Bank, the first dollar bond, euro dollar denomination, and the start of the euro dollar market happened in 1956. And the Bank of England, which was at that time, we were, of course, we were part of the Bretton Woods settlement and therefore supposed to regulate. Uh, uh, all financial services, um, the Bank of England chose to not regulate it on the grounds that this was, this was a, um, a foreign currency and therefore it was the responsibility of the Fed to, 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 to regulate it. But of course the Fed had no jurisdiction in this country, so we, we triggered this massive rise in the offshore financial markets. Um, Britain truly is at the core of this. It's by far the biggest player. We have 20%, sorry, 24% of the global market in this area. And that makes us the biggest player. Much larger than Switzerland, larger than Luxembourg, larger than the United States itself. So what can we do? What should we do? Clearly we've got to do something about it. We have to inform ourselves. Um, there's a, a book which I've handed out, but there are other very good books if you really want to get into this subject. There's a book called Treasure Islands, written by a colleague of mine, Nick Shackson, it's a fantastic book. Have any of you read it? Yep, great. It's very, very readable, um, but it's an extraordinary exploration into this, this offshore world. Um, discuss with friends, colleagues and neighbours, support the tax justice movements, challenge this idea of competitiveness. We're setting up a new group, a new network of political economists, um, and I, you know, Nick Shackson and I are working to make that into a global network. Every time a politician uses that word competitiveness, hold her feet to the fire and say, what exactly does, do you mean by this? Um, challenge company directors on their tax policies. Um, visit our website. I, I hope you've, you're familiar with our website, but if you're not, we produce a monthly podcast, which is a really good thing. That's the book I mentioned. Our new website on this um, tax competition thing is called Fool's Gold. Um, we, all of these icons click through to available resources. There's quite a lot of video films and other things available on this. We need to get a global dialogue going. And in Britain, in particular, we want to challenge Britain's development strategy, which is so heavily based on the Tax Haven Project. I wrote to the Queen in November 2013 and said, Your Majesty, you are the Queen of Tax Havens. Please impress upon your... I didn't put it quite like that. Um, please impress upon the, your Prime Minister the importance of tackling this, because David Cameron had made commitments to G20 to strengthen information exchange processes, and strengthen company accounting and so on. And she wrote back the following day and said, um, of course, I can't do anything about it. But all I asked you to do was talk to the Prime Minister and stress the importance of it. But the truth of the matter is, we've made this the core of our development strategy. We don't talk about development strategies in Britain, do we? But the City of London is the world's biggest tax haven, and we've made the City of London our biggest industry. And whatever they demand, 
they get because we can't resist them, because we're dependent, too dependent, and we're, state ca we're a captured state. We're captive to their interests. So we now need to get a conversation going in this country about how we can roll that back. So I'm going to stop there. That's Nick Shackson's book. Mm -hmm.